this video is meant to outline the basic costs of flooding Laguna Salada as part of an environmental restoration of essentially the entire northern gulf. In the delta, we will need to use dredges to extend and connect many of the existing channels so that we reduce the friction that holds back the tide from penetrating in further. We'll also have to expand the existing Coyote Canal and this bridge is probably large enough to accommodate phase one supply lines. In phase two we'll need a second one this size and a third one for the return line. In sizing the bridge for the channel a couple obvious questions are what will the flow line be and are the supporting piles deep enough uh, to support the bridge with a deeper channel? To answer the question regarding the flow line under the bridge of the channel that we'll create, I submit a weird but probably true fact is that relative to the rest of the world, the sea level at the mouth of the Colorado River is 2.5 meters higher than about everywhere else in the rest of the world. Scientists have speculated that this is due to the Coriolis effect or possibly a Faraday wave at the mouth of the Gulf of California. I would like our friends in Mexico to confirm this with the tidal station because if true, it confirms that just trenching existing channels and canals a little deeper to alleviate the friction involved in the incoming tide will allow us to easily and inexpensively flood Laguna Salada in phase one and create an efficient circulation system to battle the massive evaporation in the area so we have a living, breathing Laguna Salada with good water quality. Tides can be massive and we should be careful of how much we dredge in the estuary or delta because we could dredge too much and cause flows to flow over the highway. Yes, tides at the mouth of the Colorado River are actually higher than the uh, existing road and dredging too much could cause them to flow over the top. We don't want the flow line of our channel to be above that of the road, obviously. If we nail the flow line elevation for the existing bridge, we should be able to accommodate a channel this size in phase one going through the existing bridge. In phase two or three, we'll need to have two such channels for supply and one such channel for return. Breaking down phase one even further, I'd suggest that we start by trenching around in this area to extend all the way to the Coyote Canal and monitor flows at the bridge. Make sure we're about right. We can always add more later to supply more water to both the channel and to the estuary. So if we limit our phase one scope of work to simply flooding Laguna Salada and determining flows, um, how the flow line under the bridge and what we'll need to do for the return bridge and other functions, we can defer the cost of additional bridges, road realignment and additional channels to later phases and this would make phase one budget look something like this. Now I put it in a form similar to the uh, pipeline submission to the Salton Sea Authority on the right, ours would be on the left, about 15 million dollars. Phases two and three would be far more expensive. Um, but this allows us to get off the ground, moving forward, and getting something accomplished at a small cost. I'm sorry this is so blurry, but my little video processor has issues with text. Anyways, um, the rest of this video justifies costs of phases two and three, and really what we should build in this area. Please understand we should seek to achieve financing for the entire project because if we just complete phase one and leave it as it is, Laguna Salada would go hypersaline pretty quick. 
without a return system, we'd end up with the same situation the salt and sea faces and dead fish, uh, algal blooms, anoxic conditions are not conducive for a productive sea. A guiding principle of anything we plan or build here should be to work with the forces that are already at work. We do not have control over tectonics or sea level rise, both of which are actively working to reflood Laguna Salada, and most of us fail to recognize that this process has already started. In fact, Mother Nature has been working on this for millions of years. Laguna Salada used to be open ocean until silts and sands from Colorado River filled it in several million years ago. It's highly important to understand that without the silts and sands coming from the Colorado River, the geologic process of opening up Laguna Salada to a inland sea has been going on for almost a hundred years. Tectonic forces are literally at work here, so we need to make a decision. Do we want to fight it or manage it? In order to manage it and to get entitlements to start phase one, we will need to address the legitimate concerns of other interested parties. One such legitimate concern is water availability in the upper delta in terms of tidal or salt waters to mix with incoming fresher water from the Rio Hardy. Um, we can, through channelization, provide enough salt water to accommodate their needs. Another important issue is aquifers controlled by Canagua, and these are part of a separate sort of geologic structure that is not really as much part of the subsidence zone. Um, that are separated by altitude and by a less permeable layer. Uh, these aquifers are significant, may produce as much as 14,000 acre feet a year of fresh water. Many of you are already familiar with the types of dredges we intend on using here and that these cost about 34 cents a cubic yard to move dirt. Dirt can be either sprayed up to the upper shelves or piped away in floating pipelines down into the larger channels of the delta. Uh, this would allow it to flow out to sea in the outgoing tides. The tide itself may be a stronger tool than the dredges. Tidal energy comes into the mouth and is focused up into the northern gulf where tides in the northern gulf have a range of at least six meters and primarily enter through the Sonora side and come back down through the uh, Baja channel. This affects not only salinity levels but turbidity levels as well. That's the amount of dirt suspended in the water column. A link to the title chart for El Golfo de Santa Clara is included with this video. Uh, it should be noted that tides can be massive. For instance, on August 30th and 31st of 2019, tides of 6.3 meters above median sea level will occur. This should provide an excellent chance to use drones and capture video of saltwater entering and going through Coyote Canal. The effects on sediment transport of the second largest tidal regime in the world have been well documented. Tides of 6 meters or so in the northern gulf can be amplified to 12 meters in the mouth of the Colorado River. Currents in the old river channel can be as high as 300 centimeters per second. That's 9.84 feet per second in this area where the red line is. Since the 2010 earthquake, the flooded area has increased no matter what the height of the tide is. But a secondary consideration is, is that sea level rise of just 3.3 millimeters per year would increase the water flux through this area. For every 10 years of sea level rise, water flux through this area would increase by about a half a million acre feet per year. This increase in relative tidal energy increases the tidal regime and erosion and deposition of materials from within the delta itself into the northern gulf along the Baja Peninsula. A link to this paper is also included.
A brief analogy of this process can be illustrated with a gold pan. When you add water to essentially Colorado River stream bed materials, it is hard to pan for gold because you just simply cannot see through the fine materials that are always okay. present. This is why outgoing flows look like this. And, you know, in the channel itself, they're, they're dark brown. Once you get up on top of the tidal plains from the incoming tide, the water's a lot more transparent. Okay, there's not as much fine material that exists over here for the incoming tide to move in. All of it moves out along the Baja side. The reason why this is important is that we may consider using explosives to supplement the erosion and move material out to sea. A combination of dredging and explosives could produce a efficient enough um, erosion enhancement to maximize the turbidity of outgoing waters and give us a, the ability to flood a much bigger area, increasing water availability. In the Delta region, there are at least four faults capable of producing major quakes that will affect the Delta area. In the last hundred years or so, they've produced at least seven quakes greater than 6.4, most of them in the sevens. We also know that the 7.2 El Mayor of 2010 caused liquefaction in the delta, and that this liquefaction caused the sands to settle by as much as a meter. A repeat of the 1935 5.3, a direct hit, could have a similar effect. A different way for the ground to subside is for the underlying basement rock to actually slip down. This is a detachment fault that was responsible for the original flooding of Laguna Salada and the silts and sands were brought in by the Colorado River. They're shown in yellow. Canagua also has a legitimate concern that needs to be addressed and this can be done using the geology. Here shown in green the silts and sands already carry percolation from the delta and the northern gulf. A saltwater water table already exists in pretty much the original silts and sands that were flooded in to the Laguna Salada. The freshwater aquifers that exist in the region exist above and to the outside of the area that will be flooded. The saltwater portion of the aquifer will rise with sea level, and this will occur regardless of what we do. A portion of the salt present in the lower portions of Laguna Salada may be partially due to saltwater seepage into these areas. More and better cross-sections of this area where the aquifers exist is available in other papers and all of these papers will have links associated with them. Here at cross section 4957 and ELS or borehole 2 this paper provides highly re relevant information. First the borehole information is highly useful for knowing what the subgrade is. Second the other half of the Graben uh, has a fault on the western side where the Laguna Salada side slips down and the western shore moves up. On Google Earth this creates a shoreline elevation contrast that's clearly visible. Overlaying the locations of the aquifers and putting in a presumed shoreline for Laguna Salada we can um, see that there is some distance between them but more importantly a clear contrast in elevation. Unfortunately, my video processor isn't making the elevation in the lower right-hand corner clear, but you'll just need to go onto Google Earth and find the date palm farm and look at the shoreline contrast and elevation. Simply put, groundwater does not like to percolate uphill across fault lines against an uphill head gradient or even through intervening soils. So unless they suck this aquifer entirely dry on a yearly basis, the chances of any saltwater penetration into the uphill freshwater aquifer are small. 
the last major existing condition that I'd like to talk about that justifies or impacts the costs of phase one is the massive evaporation of 2.42 meters per year. This rate has been mentioned in two separate papers and the second paper actually compares uh, Lake Mukwata, which is simply another name for Laguna Salada, with a evaporative rate of 242 centimeters uh, versus the Salton Sea at 182. What this means in short is that shortly after the completion of phase one, we'll have to complete phase two. Just moving water into Laguna Salada, salt water, will be like train loads of salt moving into the area. Salinity in the area will become toxic to most of the biology flushed in from the Sea of Cortez. This will probably cause algal blooms and an anoxic condition within the lake. This is not much different than what's going on in the Salton Sea. Now, in order to mitigate this, we'll need to do a return system where we draw water in from the northern end of Laguna Salada and bring it back out to sea somewhere close to Island Montague. With saltwater farms and evaporation ponds to the west, we can return waters to the Sea of Cortez at close to what their salinity and temperatures are at present. Only through a circulation system can we have a living system. And without a return system, there is no form of mitigation that will prevent Laguna Salada from going relatively hypersaline. So considering the fact that areas beyond the red line here are probably the most endangered shorelines in the world from sea level rise, subsidence, earthquakes, etc. Financing and construction of phase one should be understood to be the starting point and need needs to have phase two follow closely behind. In short, turning Laguna Salada into the Dead Sea does nothing for us. Okay, there's lots more to talk about, uh, but this video is long enough, so I'll leave you with one thought. The mouth of the Colorado has channels that look like, essentially like this, with, see the high bank in the background? If in this area we choose to create a little check dam or erosion control measure, we can tilt the playing field, capture more tidal water, maybe create a second circulation system that shortcuts the larger one and allows us to mix more waters. I would like to find out the truth behind this story about 12 meter high uh, tides at the mouth with currents of 300 centimeters a second, that's three meters a second. If so, we can build a check dam in an environment that looks like this in calmer times, utilizing a geo tube running across the channel, uh, fill, riprap. Such a structure would prevent as much as three and a half meters of estuary water from draining out during extreme low tides. Building a check dam in the mouth of the Colorado River about two meters high would prevent about three and a half meters of water draining out during extreme low tides that accompany the highest tides. When the tide is coming in, this sort of check dam would do little to slow down the incoming tide. And the highest tides would come over at, at quite a surplus of altitude. More dredging may be required to connect the return pond with the supply pond, but providing mixing prior to release back into the northern gulf will mitigate waters in terms of salinity and temperature. Okay team, there's always more to talk about and I look forward to your comments. This is about where I think the check dam should be. I'm sure that you have plenty of thoughts and I look forward to hearing them. Let's make this the best project we can possibly make it. Thank you.